I'm going to do a very special type show tonight. Well, as if every show that we do is not a special type show. <laughs> Why, George, that was a terrible thing for you to say. I mean, I know your type, but uh, you should at least try to keep it a little bit under control. What the... <laughs> Hello, Herb. How are you tight? You didn't win the lottery again. <laughs> By George, that surprises me. A very special type show. So call your friends, kick the cat out, and here we go. Well, uh, tonight's show is about the guy who died today. Very interesting, and uh, not only interesting, but I think a significant person. And a guy who uh, played uh, somewhat of a role in my life, and I suspect I played somewhat of a role in his. In fact, I know I did. And it was vice versa. Jack Kerouac. You probably uh, heard it today on the news. And uh, it's a funny thing about Kerouac, because I, I feel that, uh, you know, since uh, I was involved, and a lot of people I know were involved in uh, that whole thing, that whole thing that uh, kind of exploded down in the village at that period, and around, in fact, around the country, but particularly in the village, that uh, I figured that... Uh, it is my duty, as well as my pleasure, really, to talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> to talk about Kerouac and that whole scene. I remember, uh, if you don't mind, this is uh, going to the Tonight Show is about Jack Kerouac, and if you don't know who Kerouac was, he died today. And Kerouac was a novelist who, and uh, a poet too, although he kind of brought the two together. He was a poetic novelist, really, who worked mostly uh, in the fifties and continue to work, I guess, right up to his death. But his great fame uh, was uh, roughly in the period of about 1959 through the early 60s. And that's, of course, his great fame nationwide, in fact, uh, around the world. But prior to that, people knew him. He was around. He was he lived in the village and, and uh, was involved with a whole lot of people who at that time were groping around to do things and to get things going and and to start a whole movement, which is really, in a sense, still going on. I, I don't make any of the differentiations that most of the, I suspect, the journalistically inclined people do. We, we love to make categories in our country. We love to say, uh, this guy belongs to that generation, this guy belongs to the ding-dong generation, that guy belongs to the uh, hot diggity dog generation. Everything is neatly categorized, but it, life isn't like that. Maybe it makes it easier to write about, but it uh, doesn't make much sense, really. And uh, Kerouac, a lot of people were involved in this whole thing that was going on down the village. It's very difficult to describe it today because it's very different today. Uh, the village has suddenly been discovered as a kind of a tourist place, and and uh, large numbers of kids are going there who just want to go there because it's the village. But in those days, there was a very different atmosphere there. And incidentally, the show tonight, I'm not talking about good days or bad days or good times or bad times. It was just different. Now, I guess the biggest difference between most of the uh, village world then and now is that the village uh, was primarily a place where people went who were doing things. They weren't there because they were putting things down or attempting to run away or escape or turn off. They were doing things, most of the people, large numbers of them anyway. And they went on drifted out in the different areas. And I remember one night uh, at the Village Voice office, and in those days, the village voice was so poor uh, that we were giving it away. I imagine that a lot of the people were actually giving it away. We would go out every night after we had finally gotten it off the presses. A few of us would go out and give it away by putting it into parked cars parked around the village. We'd stick it in the, in the window or something, hoping that they'd read it. And then the next time they would see it, they would buy it. It didn't work out that way, but that's what we thought we were doing. And there were a lot of people who were hanging around down there and just living in the, and digging the scene and walking around. And at that time, I was living on 7th Street, which is uh, the, the, the area that, at that point, just off 2nd Avenue, which is now the Lower East Village. In those days, we just called the Lower East Side, and it was Cockroach Heaven. And uh, I lived right off of 2nd uh, Avenue, and my neighborhood restaurant was Rapner's. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that was the, the beginning of a lot of things for many of us. Now, uh, 
uh, to, to more or less bring uh, you into sort of a focus of the time. There were a lot of people who have since become household words who were a part of that thing. Among them, uh, in a kind of a peripheral way, uh, people like Jules Pfeiffer, uh, other people who uh, were somewhat famous at the time, but who have since gone on to become even more so, people like Norman Mailer, and certainly Allen Ginsberg. Uh, Ginsberg was just a, a walking around, sort of a hanging around beat poet. And I remember one night getting a call from Leroy Jones, who at that time edited a, a poetry, a little poetry journal that he was turning on himself. And Jones wanted me to write the book for, of all things, an opera. And uh, he wanted to write the the, uh, the, uh, the lyrics to an opera. And he wanted another friend of ours who was also active and living in the village at the time, Charlie Mingus, to write the music. But that, of course, never worked out, although I did do an album with Charlie. And so that was a, a time of fantastic ferment, and it was a time of great change. Uh, and I think that Kerouac was the victim of an interesting phenomenon which has occurred in American writing. But Kerouac was primarily a digger, a true digger. Now, what we call a digger today is a person who really digs himself and his friends. <laughs> Whereas Kerouac was a guy who dug just everything. He dug uh, he dug the, the climate, he dug the uh, landscape, he dug the sky, and he was a positive writer. In other words, his work was pro-life. And uh, around about the early 60s, there was a sudden change in literature, and it became anti-life. In general, most of the literature today that is famous literature is a put-down of one kind or, or uh, a put-down of life primarily, a, a feeling that life is all hopeless, and, and a feeling also runs through much of literature today that it's sex-oriented really today, but it's anti-sex really. Uh, there's a great homosexual element in it, which is an, a, essentially an anti-sexual element. Uh, there's also a great element of uh, negativism that runs through it. And, of course, this was uh, almost the antithesis to the Kerouac attitude, which was a digging attitude. And uh, I remember one night uh, in the Village Voice, uh, sitting there, and at that time the Voice, as I said, was struggling, and, and uh, Ed Fancher, who was the publisher of the Voice, and... Uh, I believe Howard Smith was around at that time, and a few other people who later went on to other things. And that night uh, was was a, well, kind of the first night where a lot of a lot of the uh, in a sense the uh, elements that were existing separately all sort of drifted in and came together. Norman Mailer was there, and I remember a few weeks after that, the first time to give you an idea of how disparate the elements were, uh, I was at a party, um, I believe Tenth Street. Yeah, I don't recall the exact address, but it was on 10th Street. And uh, at this party, it was uh, it was a celebration, I believe, of the first year of The Voice. <laughs> and, they, and it was a tough year. They had no money at all. Nobody bought The Voice, but they were celebrating the fact they'd survived this first year. And we were all part of it. I was writing for The Voice at the time. It was on the masthead, incidentally. And uh, we had this little party. And at the party, I remember Kerouac was there. Very quiet. Kerouac was a quiet sort of guy, mostly when he was with a lot of people. And although he uh, uh, he was always there, somewhat moody, the way many writers are, but quiet. And at that party, uh, Kerouac was in. It was the first night I met the John Lindsay, <laughs> who was at that party too. And uh, just uh, in passing, he moved through it, and that was about it. But so you can see that there were a lot of things that were happening. Though people were drifting in all different directions, and then. Time went on, and of course, Kerouac, at that, he, had, he had just published his novel, which was a tremendous success, On the Road. But to go back a little earlier about On the Road, I had gotten in the mail. At the time that this happened, uh, I was working, <clears throat> that all this was going on. I was doing an all-night show here at WOR, and it was highly revolutionary uh, for its time and place, and would even be today. Uh, I had no guests, among other things which is a revolutionary concept in all night uh, radio. And <laughs> I didn't use records particularly, but there was a whole big thing that was going on. People were listening all over in cells, all over the place. And, and in a curious way, radio was a kind of a focal point of all this. And so uh, I, got, I got in the mail just out of the blue. I was operating by myself. I just came out from the Midwest. and I was working late at night and sweating it out, a transmitter out there, and 
working what I could do best and writing for the voice. And one night I came in and there was a letter there and a package. And it was the manuscript, not really the manuscript, but the galley copy of On the Road. And there was a note in it from Kerouac. And it said, uh, I want you to read this. I, I uh, think you might dig it. And incidentally, you're one of the characters in the novel. So I read it. And I immediately, uh, this was before it came out, I recognized it for what it was. It's a genuinely, uh, I think, a, a turning point <clears throat> in a lot of writing and a lot of attitudes in America. I think it did a great deal. And I think in 25, 30 years or more, people will rediscover Kerouac, and you'll have an actual, his real place in uh, literature will be finally settled on. I think Kerouac... Uh, uh, has direct antecedents in people like uh, Thomas Wolfe and possibly even Whitman. And uh, his, his digging qualities come through everything he writes. But I read this, and I remember sitting in the, in the corner house, uh, the Rikers Corner House at 57th and 6th Avenue. And I had just read this, and I had it still with me in, in, a, in a sort of a tacky briefcase I was carrying around. I carried my lunch around it. And uh, I had this thing with me, and I was sitting with another guy who was a cartoonist, and he uh, uh, he was from New York. And I said to him, I said, he was trying to do a little writing, and I said, I think you'll find this this is really going to make a lot of noise, this novel, this one here. And I gave it to him to read, and he, I remember the, the stunned look that he had on his face a couple of days later when I met him, because he, in a sense, represented the other kind of world, the people who a very different kind of people than Kerouac wrote about. And he later went on to become a, a well-known playwright. I'm talking about Herb Gardner, who wrote A Thousand Clowns. And we were all working together at that time, doing things together. And in fact, uh, Herb uh, did a cartoon for an album that I did at the time. And a lot of things were happening. And among them, of course, uh, the one that was nationally known at the time, who everybody knew about, was Kerouac. But it was really a movement of a lot of people, which culminated in many things. And I thought, you know, since tonight, uh, I rarely talk about these things on the air, but since uh, Kerouac died today, I thought that it would be interesting to talk a little bit about some of these things, which some of you probably don't even know exist. They just sort of suddenly uh, came on full-blown on the scene. By the way, speaking of how much radio was involved in this, I remember one day getting a call, because uh, one thing about radio is that it gives a, it gives a voice, you see, and a lot of people can, can sort of circulate around it. In a sense, it provides a, a pivotal place. It's a kind of a, a center tribal fire for people. And one day after I finished a show here at the station, I got a call from a guy who said he was really uh, uh, scratching. And he says, I see that you write for The Voice. He says, if they'll buy that wild stuff you write. And I says, well, they don't buy it, man. <laughs> I mean, it's free. In fact, uh, you know, i got to chip in every couple of days, see whether or not the paper is going to run. And he says, well, uh, maybe they'll take my stuff. And I said, okay, groovy. Uh, <laughs> although that word was not in the lexicon. Well, yes, it was, actually. The word groovy was an old word, primarily musician's words, you know. So uh, I said, fine. And uh, I worked, uh, I called Ed, and we all got together, and it was, that was Jules Pfeiffer I'm talking about. So a lot of us had peripheral effects on each other's career, one way or another. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to read some Kerouac later on. I'm going to read some of the stuff and give you an idea of what Kerouac said and how he said it and the, the quality of digging in it. Now, uh, before we go in, now, I want you to listen carefully, because in the next half hour, I'm going to read some Kerouac. And uh, I think that's the best way to talk about a guy like Kerouac is to read what he said. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying to you that Kerouac was a great novel, novelist, rather. I am saying this, though, about him, that I think that, that what he said... It, 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 has, has, is a thing that hasn't been said by many people who wrote in America. He wrote about the land and the country. I mean the whole country, not a section of the country. Uh, today, most people write almost exclusively about themselves. And in particular, they write about their sexual problems, <laughs> most generally. Portnoy's complaint is a typical example of the contemporary. Or they also, uh, on the other side, they tend to write about themselves as uh, evangel angels, uh, in short, good guys out looking at the evil world. That's another kind of writing. This is the, the mailer world. 
where, where Mailer sees himself as a great evangelist and a, a kind of bastion of good, uh, going out and looking at a decadent evil world. Well, now that's, uh, now I'm not putting that down as a valid point. I'm just saying this is essentially the way uh, the writing is. Whereas Kerouac, on the other hand, was a sort of a, a digging, totally naive, open, uh, man ain't it great to be alive type writer, which is quite rare today. Now, for those of you who don't know really the background of Kerouac, he was French-Canadian. And uh, that uh, the name, of course, he comes from New England, French-Canadian. And he, uh, dark, uh, physically a tough sort of guy. He, as a matter of fact, played football at Columbia and was a quite good football player, had been a Marine. And later, when he began to write, of course, uh, his writing went on most of his uh, adult life. He did write all the time, as far as I know. And he, uh, he was a, 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 almost a, a compulsive stream of consciousness type writer. The way he wrote was interesting. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the technique, the actual mechanical way that the guy wrote. A uh, Kerouac used to get a roll of paper, uh, the kind of paper they use for newsprint, you know, in the uh, teletype machines. He used to get a roll of paper and put it in his typewriter. He had, a, he had some kind of an adapter, so he could use his whole roll, and he could just keep typing. He didn't have to worry about pages and changing all that stuff. And he would just keep this thing going until finally he had enough a thousand yards of whatever it was he was writing, and that would be the novel. He'd clip it off, and, and uh, it would go off to the publisher. He never really rewrote, as far as I know. He just wrote as it poured out of him. And uh, he was like a giant fountain of writing. As a matter of fact, this is the way uh, Thomas Wolfe was, too although uh, Wolf was uh, possibly a little more pedantic and literary than uh, Kerouac. Kerouac was more of a primitive, but uh, their, uh, their natural life force was quite similar. And, uh, and Kerouac, uh, when On the Road came out, of course, it was a tremendous uh, thing all over the country, in fact, all over the world, and it kind of set the tone for a period. And On the Road was about that. It was a trip on the road. It was. Uh, it started out in New York, and his opening line, he simply says, I first met Dean not long after my wife and I split up. I'd just gotten over a serious illness that I won't bother to talk about, except that it had something to do with a miserable, weary split up and my feeling that everything was dead. And that's when he began his trip in the novel across the road, He'd always, across the country. He'd always wanted to visit uh, the rest of the country, and he says, and I skip a bit here, and then the first page or two, and then he goes on to say, I'd been poring over maps of the United States in Patterson for months, He's talking about Jersey here, even reading books about the pioneers and savoring names like Platt and Cimarron and so on. And on the road map was one long red line called Route 6 that led from the tip of Cape Cod to Eli, Nevada, and there dipped down to Los Angeles. I'll just stay on 6 all the way to Eli, I said to myself. And I confidently started. To get to six, I had to go up the Bear Mountain, filled with dreams of what I'd do in Chicago, in Denver, and then finally in San Francisco. I took the 7th Avenue subway to the end of the line at 242nd Street. And there I took a streetcar to Yonkers. <laughs> He's going across the country. In downtown Yonkers, I transferred to an outgoing trolley and went to the city limits on the east bank of the Hudson River. If you drop a rose in the Hudson River at its mysterious source in the Adirondacks, think of all the places it journeys by as it goes to sea forever. Think of that wonderful Hudson Valley. Well, I started hitching up the thing. Five scattered rides took me to the desired Bear Mountain Bridge where Route 6 arched in from New England. It began to rain in torrents when I was let off there. So that's the beginning of it. Isn't it not a nice start for a, for a book? Now, uh, I'll, I'll skip down to where he's in Newburgh, New York. He's been hitchhiking uh, to Newburgh, and uh, he started out. So he, one thing about him, he had a he had uh, he had a good sense of humor about himself. So I stepped right up and I gestured in the rain. He said, "I look like a maniac, of course, with my hair all wet, my shoes sopping, my shoes damn fool that I am, were Mexican hirachis, plant like sieves, not fit for the rainy night of America." and the raw road night. But uh, here he is in Newburgh, and now he's beginning his trip across the country by bus and by hitchhiking in every possible way. And, I, and I've dug up something else here. If you'll get that turntable ready in there, Herb. Now, the turntable now. Now, wait, I'll give you the cue for this. 
There was another guy. Of course, musicians were all part of this movement. I'll have to bring a lot of different people into this this great saga of that period. Just about that time, as, as I had just come in, I was very fortunate. I came to New York just at the time it was all beginning, and, and guys were coming from all different parts of the country without any knowledge of each other. It wasn't a matter of... It just New York was drawing people like a magnet then. And uh, one night, uh, not long after I'd gotten here, it was a hot uh, August night, I remember, uh, I, I got a phone call from a guy, and, and it was a, a musician, but one of the... If there, if there could have been called the epitome, and I'm going to use the phrase that became popular at the time, the beat musician, it was Lenny Tristano. Uh, he had a loft somewhere, I believe, on 32nd Street. And I went into this loft, and it was dark, and everybody was sitting around, purple lights, and, and the, the smoke was swirling, and Tristano, who was a blind pianist, was quietly playing away over in the corner, and girls were lying around all over the floor. It was all, it was all the part of that great exploding thing. And uh, later on, it spread over to the Cedars Bar and to Dillon's. And, of course, at that time, uh, people were, a lot of the uh, people who, uh, people like Dylan Thomas were still around, hanging around places like the White Horse. So I thought that uh, a little of this, the, the music has to set the mood. This is, the, this is Tristano. And this was all at the time when Kerouac was writing and the Village Voice was beginning and everything was starting to explode. And... A lot of old things were falling by the road, and a lot of new things were beginning, although nobody quite knew it at the time. We were just there, and it was strange and hot and, and sweaty and, and very exciting. This is Chapter 3, or part of it, of On the Road by Jack Kerouac, who was part of that whole scene. It was an ordinary bus trip. He just left Newburgh with crying babies and hot sun and country folk getting out at one pen town after another, Till we got onto the plain of Ohio and really rolled up by Ashtabula and straight across Indiana in the night. I arrived in Chicago quite early in the morning, got a room in the Y, and went to bed with a very few dollars in my pocket. And then I dug Chicago after a good night's sleep. The wind from Lake Michigan, jazz in the loop, long walks around South Halstead and North Clark, and one long walk after midnight into the jungles where a cruising car followed me like a suspicious character. At this time, 1947, Bop was going like mad all over America. The fellows at the loop blew, but with a tired air, because Bop was somewhere between its Charlie Parker ornithology period and another period that began with Miles Davis. And as I sat there listening to that sound of the night which Bop has come to represent from all of us, I thought of all my friends, from one end of the country to the other, and how they were really all in the same vast backyard, doing something so frantic and rushing about. And for the first time in my life, the following afternoon, I went into the West, the West that I'd always dreamed about. It was a warm and beautiful day for hitchhiking. To get out of the impossible complexities of Chicago traffic, I took a bus to Joliet, Illinois, and went by the Joliet Pen, stationed myself just outside of town after a walk through its leafy, rickety streets behind and pointed my way all the way from New York to Joliet by bus. And already I'd spent more than half of my money. Well, the first ride was a dynamite truck with a red flag about 30 miles into great green Illinois. The truck driver pointing out the place where Route 6, which we were on, intersects Route 66, before they both shoot west for incredible distances. Along about three in the afternoon, after an apple pie and ice cream in a roadside stand, a woman stopped for me in a little coupe. I had a twinge of hard joy as I ran after the car. But she was a middle-aged woman, actually the mother of sons my age, and wanted somebody to help her to drive to Iowa. I was all for it. Iowa! Not so far from Denver. And once I got to Denver, I could relax. She drove the first few hours. At one point, insisted on visiting an old church somewhere, as if we were tourists. Then I took the wheel over. And although I'm not much of a driver, I drove clear through the rest of Illinois to Davenport, Iowa, via Rock Island. And here, for the first time in my life, I saw the beloved Mississippi. Dry in the summer haze, low water, with its big, rank smell that smells like the raw body of America itself, because it washes it up. Rock Island. Railroad tracks, shacks, small downtown section. And over the bridge to Davenport, 
Same kind of town, all smelling of sawdust and the warm Midwest sun. Here, the lady had to go on to her Iowa hometown by another route, and I got out. The sun was going down. I walked. After a few cold beers to the edge of town, and it was a long walk. A long, long walk. All the men were driving home from work, wearing railroad hats, baseball hats, all kinds of hats, just like after work in any town anywhere. One of them gave me a ride up the hill and left me at a lonely crossroads on the edge of the big prairie. It was beautiful there. The only cars that came by were farm cars. They gave me suspicious looks. They clanked along. The cows were coming home. Not a truck. A few cars zipped by. A hot rod kid came by with his scarf flying. The sun went down, all the way down. And now I was standing in the purple darkness. Now I was scared. There weren't even any lights in the Iowa countryside. In a minute, nobody would be able to see me. Luckily, a man going back to Davenport gave me a lift downtown. But now I was right where I started from. Well, I went to sit in the bus station and think this over. I ate another apple pie and ice cream. And in fact, that's practically all I ate all the way across the country. I knew it was, of course, nutritious. And it was delicious, of course. I decided to gamble. I took a bus in downtown Davenport after spending a half hour watching a waitress in a bus station cafe and rode to the city limits, but this time near the gas stations. Here the big trucks roared, wham, and inside two minutes, one of them cranked to a stop for me. I ran for it with my soul hollering whoopee. And what a driver, a big, tough truck driver with popping eyes and a hoarse, raspy voice who just slammed and kicked at everything, got his rig underway, and paid hardly any attention to me. So I could rest my tired soul a little. For one of the biggest troubles hitchhiking is having to talk to innumerable people, make them feel that they didn't make a mistake picking you up, even entertain them almost, all of which is a great strain when you're going all the way and don't plan to sleep in hotels. The guy just yelled over the roar. Once in a while, he'd holler something at me, and all I could do was yell back. So we relaxed, and he bawled that thing clear to Iowa City and yelled me the funniest stories about how he got around the law in every town that had an unfair speed limit, saying over and over again the one thing he said all the time, yelling it out, them damn cops don't put no flies on me. <laughs> Just as we rolled into Iowa City, he saw another truck coming behind us, and because he had to turn off at Iowa City, he blinked his taillights at the other guy and slowed down for me to jump out, which I did with my bag. And the other truck, acknowledging this exchange, stopped for me. And once again, in the twink of nothing, I was in another big high cab, all set to go, hundreds of miles across the night. And man, was I happy. And the new truck driver was as crazy as the other, and yelled just as much. And all I had to do was just lean back and roll on, and roll on. Now I could see Denver looming ahead of me like the promised land, way out there beneath the stars, across the prairie of Iowa and the plains of Nebraska, and I could see the greater vision of San Francisco beyond, like jewels in the night. Well, he bawled the jack and told stories for a couple of hours, and then at a town in Iowa, where years later Dean and I were stopped on suspicion in what looked like a stolen Cadillac, he slept a few hours in the seat. I slept, too. I took one little walk along the lonely brick walls illuminated by one lamp, with the prairie brooding at the end of each little street and the smell of the corn like dew in the night. Suddenly he woke up with a start at dawn, and off we roared. And an hour later, the smoke of Des Moines appeared ahead over the green cornfields. He had to eat his breakfast now and wanted to take it easy. So I went right on into Des Moines, about four miles, hitching a ride with two boys from the University of Iowa. It was strange sitting in their brand-new comfortable car and hear him talk of exams as we zoom smoothly into town. Now I wanted to sleep a whole day. So I went to the Y to get a room. They didn't have any. By instinct, I wandered down to the railroad tracks. There's a lot of them in Des Moines. And I wound up in a gloomy old Plains Inn of a hotel by the locomotive roundhouse and spent a long day sleeping on a big, clean, hard white bed with dirty remarks carved in the wall beside my pillow and the beet yellow window shades pulled over the smoky scene of the railroad yards. I woke up a long time after just as the sun was getting red. And that was the one distinct time in my life, the strangest moment of all, 
when I didn't know who I was. I was far away from home, haunted, tired with travel, in a cheap hotel room I'd never seen, hearing the hiss of steam outside and the creak of the old wood of the hotel and footsteps upstairs and all the sad sounds. And I looked at the cracked high ceiling and really didn't know who I was for about 15 strange seconds. I wasn't scared. I was just somebody else, some stranger. And my whole life was a haunted life, the life of a ghost. I was halfway across America at the dividing line between the east of my youth and the west of my future. And maybe that's why it happened right then and there, that strange red afternoon. But I had to get going and stop moaning. So I picked up my bag, said so long to the old hotel keeper, sitting by his spit tone, and went to eat. I ate apple pie and ice cream. <laughs> it was getting better as I got deeper into Iowa. The pie bigger, the ice cream richer. There were the most beautiful girls everywhere. I looked, everywhere I looked in Des Moines that afternoon. They were coming home from high school. But I had no time for thoughts like that. But I promised myself a ball in Denver. Carlo Marx was already in Denver. Dean was there. Chad King and Tom Gray were there. It was their hometown. Mary Lou was there. And there was mention of a mighty gang, including Ray Rollins and his beautiful blonde sister, Babe Rollins. Two waitresses Dean knew, the Betancourt sisters, and even Roland Major, my old college writing buddy, was there. I rushed, and I looked forward to all of them with joy. So I rushed past the pretty girls. And believe me, the prettiest girls in the world live in Des Moines. Interesting book, isn't it? Just rolls on and on. And then he goes on. He says, a guy with a kind of tool shack on wheels, a truck full of tools that he drove, standing up like a modern milkman, gave me a ride up the long hill, where I immediately got a ride from a farmer and his son heading out for Adel in Iowa. In this town, under a big elm tree near a gas station, I made the acquaintance of another hitchhiker a typical New Yorker, an Irishman who had been driving a truck for the post office most of his work years and was now headed for a girl in Denver and a new life. I think he was running away from something in New York, the law most likely. He was a real red-nosed young drunk of 30 and would have bored me ordinarily, except now my senses were sharp for any kind of human friendship after hitchhiking for so many hours. He wore a big sweater and baggy pants and had nothing... Nothing with him at all in the way of a bag, just a toothbrush sticking out of his pocket and handkerchiefs. He said we ought to hitch together. I should have said no, because he looked awful on the road. But we stuck together, and we got a ride with a taciturn, silent man to Stewart, Iowa, a town in which we were really stranded. So we stood in front of the railroad ticket shack in Stewart, waiting for the westbound traffic till the sun went down. A good five hours just standing by the road, dawdling away the time, at first telling about ourselves. Then he told dirty stories. Then we kicked pebbles, made goofy noises of one kind or another. We got bored. I decided to spend the buck on beer. We went to an old saloon in Stewart, had a few. It was bad beer. Then he got as drunk as he ever did in his Ninth Avenue night back home and yelled all night <laughs> his sordid stories of his life. I kind of liked him, not because he was a good sort, as he later proved to be, but because he was just enthusiastic about things and just dig, standing around, kicking the stones. <laughs> so that's Kerouac, and that was the beginning of On the Road. And, uh, uh very interesting. Uh, you know, it, it's funny how all our styles sort of melt. You notice there's a little style. You can see some similarities in my work, and there, there's all kinds of similarities. That, that by the way, was uh, Lee Conus that was playing behind us, who was at that time, of course, part of that whole scene. It's funny how, how uh, quite often during during the time of something, uh, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, the, the press will pick up something and completely distort it in uh, the minds of uh, the non hip people who just read what's said in the press. The one thing that Kerouac was not was really avant-garde. His writing goes back to, I would say, probably the closest to his actual writing would be Thomas Wolfe. Although he does some great and wonderful things in his writing, uh, his best work, I think, is, uh, is his descriptive work. And I heard uh, 
throw down a little other things about, uh, you know, with that whole milieu. I'd like to do something on that sometime. I think one of these days I'll have to write something about it. But uh, uh, a few years ago, when the Herald Trib was still in action here in town, the editor of the Herald Trib book review section called me. And uh, that was, uh, well, he called me for a reason. He said uh, that, that Kerouac's latest book had just come out, and he said that we'd like you to review you to review it for us. He said because you're in uh, on the road. This fellow uh, who edited their book review section, by the way, his name is Dick Kluger. You might have seen his name around. And he said you're in the book, you know, and, and that Kerouac knows you, and, and uh, you know that scene that would be great if you reviewed it. So I reviewed Big Sur for the Herald Trib. And I later learned that, uh, that Kerouac carried that review around with him, which was a strange kind of a <laughs> review. But I, I'll leave you with this note. Uh, for those of you who read On the Road, I would like to recommend it to you if, uh, if you've never read it. Uh, you may find it very interesting now looking at it from the standpoint of uh, possibly eight or nine years. Let's see, when was it published originally? Oh, shucks. It, uh... Yeah, it was published originally in 1957, 55 and 57. It was actually published in 57. And uh, I'll leave you with one note. Uh, for those of you who read it and know the whole scene, what character in On the Road did Kerouac use me in? Just a question. And can you identify any of the others? Some are around, some are not. But uh, that was a great and wild and fascinating time, which incidentally all times are. <laughs> I make no differentiation between times. And that was the beginning of a lot of things. And uh, who knows how far it will eventually go. So, Jack Kerouac, who is now on the road, hail, farewell. <laughs>